Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're live on the internet, uh, which is approximately my least favorite thing. So I'm going to be brief up here. Uh, my name is Matt Weiss. I'm a director of marketing at Brooks. And on behalf of our entire team, welcome to the 2023 Hyperion House. Uh, I'm also a proud New Yorker, as are Chris and Kyle. So we're going to pivot from tomorrow or Monday's race. Uh, and we're going to do a deep dive on the Knicks-Cavs playoff series. So uh, get those questions ready, folks. Now, um, we are going to preview the race. Uh, we are extremely excited about it. Um, and uh, on behalf of the entire Brooks team, you know, we consider it an honor and a privilege to get to work with the Sidious team. Um, I don't remember the first time I came across their work. Um, I also don't remember the first time I heard the Beatles. Uh, but guess what? They're both really great. So, um, you know, we get to do a lot of fun things here. We get to work with a lot of great people. These three are amongst uh, the best people that we get to work with. So we're super excited about this hour. Uh, I hope you're sticking around for trivia after this. Um, and um, so on behalf of the entire Brooks team, let me work on Chris Chavez, Kyle Merber, and the pride of Flemington, New Jersey, Daniel Giordano. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Bernardsville, New Jersey, and uh, go Devils. They're going to take down the Rangers. It's okay. Awesome. Well, that was like the best intro we've ever gotten before one of these live shows. Hey, uh, everyone, thanks for coming out. This is the first time we've ever done one of these live shows in front of a live audience. Uh, usually we're just in front of Mac, like in yelling, front of Mac, at, us yelling at him, spewing our own hot takes. But we're super pumped. This is our second year here at the Hyperion House. Last year we did a alternate broadcast on Marathon Monday that more than 20,000 people like tuned in to watch us just react to things in real time, give our commentary some live updates. And so we'll be doing that again on Monday morning. Uh, so look out for, for that. But it's been a super exciting time around the 127th Boston Marathon. Uh, this morning, we kicked it off with a morning run that had Des Linden come out. Uh, what'd you make of just kind of the whole atmosphere so far? We've been in Boston for 24 hours. First impressions. I can't believe how slow everyone walks on Newberry Street. It's impossible like it to is. get anywhere. I'm just walking in the middle of the road. Yeah. That's but the, the road's closed, it. so you're good. Is yeah. it just everyone saving their legs or their window shopping? There's just so much action going on. You want to miss a second. You want to completely empty your wallet before you run on Monday, too, buying things in all these incredible stores. And you, you used to live here, so, I mean, I guess, like, Marathon Weekend, how does that compare to just, like, any other weekend? This has got to be the best. Yeah, I mean, I used to run here you know, on a team, and that's a different type of weekend. You're doing the 5K, you're running around, you're hanging out with the kids, you're trying to see what everything has to offer. But I'm most excited for, you know, the 100 Golden Retriever event that's, oh, that's going to happen tomorrow at 10 a.m., you know, in honor of Penny and Spencer. So yeah. there's always fun things like that on Boston Marathon weekend that you never know what's going to happen. And everyone's just so happy, which is really unlike Boston in general. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so for the people who might be watching this on YouTube, listening to this in podcast form, or just a reminder to everyone, you can tune in to the actual broadcast. It starts at, let me pull it up here, 9.37 a.m. for the pro men, 9.47 for the pro women. You can watch on WCVB ABC or on ESPN and the ESPN app. But I would recommend just, you know, you can watch that and then mute your TVs and watch along with us because it's going to be a bit more uh, fun. But let's let's start by talking to some of the runners who will be competing in those elite races. Let's welcome two-time U.S. champion, uh, one of the newest Brooks Pro Runners, Erica Kemp. Let's give it up for Erica. <laughs> also, local legend as well. Uh, and then we've also got 210 marathoner and Strava legend, CJ Albertson. CJ, come on up. <laughs> first things first, I guess, how are you guys feeling? I guess I'm feeling about how I expected to. I mean, I'm really, really excited. I had the most wonderful shakeout this morning. I usually see a lot of people I know out on the river, and there's usually like, maybe one or two go Erica's, but I got so many good luck Erica's this morning and I'm hoping I'm going to get maybe a couple thousand more. Yeah. Um, and that should hopefully give me a good race on Monday. First one, I guess like a little bit of nerves or like how training for all of us, how have you kind of gone about envisioning your first marathon? I'm pretty bad at visualizing. Um, so I haven't <laughs> envisioned much, but I was talking to my coach this morning and he was like, are you feeling nervous, excited? Um, those two things feel the same. And as we get closer to race day, I'm feeling a lot of both. 
Um, so when I do start to get really nervous, I try to convince myself it's excitement. So it's like a 50-50 toss, but Monday morning, it'll be excitement. Do you sleep in your own bed? Like before the race? Or are you in the hotel? I did sleep in my own bed up until last night. Okay. So I was told I should get the full marathon experience. And it is like, there is so much energy downtown. It's a little overwhelming, but at the same time, there's just like such a great atmosphere that I was told to soak it in. So I took the tea a few stops down and moved into the hotel last night. So Erica, there was a runner's world article about you getting lost on one of your long training runs. So I know you've lived in Boston for a few years now. How well do you think you actually know the course? Um, yeah, so I've lived here about five years and I know the last six to 10 miles of the course incredibly well, like the back of my hand. But that first 10 to 12, I have never seen in my life until I started training. That's for this a lie. Race. We went to Hopkinton once when we were on the same team together. That's what I mean. They dropped me off in Ashland and said, run to the finish line. Like, I don't know where that is. <laughs> um, so we got a little off course, but we'll be fine. We've seen it now. CJ, do you know the course? I mean, you've now raced it a, a few times. Like, do you know you where just, you are out there? I think you just run straight. There's not really any <laughs> turns. <laughs> um, so it is a straight line, but it looks straighter on the map than in real life because you can have a four lane road and like sometimes it might not be like super, super straight. And sometimes there's like on ramps to the highway and like it might be snowing and it looks straight. And that's what happened. <laughs> so CJ, I mean, the tangents then, if you're up front, you can take the tangents. But do you ever get bothered by some of the other athletes who, you know, are running down the long way on this straightish line? Uh, sometimes, but in, yeah, in Boston, there's so few turns. I mean, it, it doesn't happen. <laughs> you're just running down the you're just running down the road, one road until you get to the last you know, a couple miles is a few turns. Really, the last mile is the only time there's turns. So, yeah, Boston, you really don't have to worry about it. Um, but, yeah. So, CJ, yesterday we got the chance to catch up at the press conference. You said you went through a short period where you're, like, not that motivated to train, and then eventually you kicked yourself in the butt and were just like, all right, I'm back on it, and you ran a couple 160-mile weeks, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, how, how do you do it? Can I do the deep dive? Yes. Okay. okay. So Kyle's obsessed with, with, so there is, there was like a back to back 158, 162 mile week, <laughs> but in there, there was a seven day period that totaled 178 miles. So day one, <laughs> here, hold my Olipop <laughs> day one, 24 miles at 550 pace in the morning. And then in the evening for a shakeout, you went 10 miles. <laughs> right? Like we're, we're all adding the math up already. We're day one. We're 34 miles in on that second run. Did you get lost? It was probably on the treadmill. I don't know. Do you have <laughs> I, I took notes. I, I lost I note was that it was on the treadmill. treadmill. So I got a little lost, but <laughs> I found my way. <laughs> Are you watching TV when you're on the treadmill? What do you do? Music? Yeah. I usually watching TV, um, sometimes music, but mostly TV, but I, now I do it all with, um, earphones in so you know the child can sleep because you don't want to you don't want to wake up the baby <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have to cut your run short um next day 11 miles easy in the morning p.m four miles only a 15 mile day we're skipping right over that the next day you ran a two mile warm-up then you did 20 miles at 504 pace is that accurate probably i don't know <laughs> your last mile the is right yeah your last mile was 433 and then you did a mile cool down. And then that evening you went out and ran 10 miles again. So another 35 <laughs> mile day, but you were saving it because the next day you had a workout because you had to run 16, four hundreds. And then during lunch, you went out and you ran eight miles at five minute pace. <laughs> and this is your first triple of the week. Cause that night you went out and you ran five more miles the next day, <laughs> just easy runs 12 in the morning, eight at lunch, four at night. The triple thing is crazy. <laughs> like no one here should ever do that <laughs> except you. Apparently like Erica, you're not tripling, right? Absolutely. Not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, six miles easy. This one I like at lunch. You did 12 miles downhill. How does that work? Uh, yeah. 
I think I. What mountain did you fall <laughs> off of? <laughs> no, sometimes I do it at the gym, but that one was at my house. Uh, the Peloton doesn't have it downhill, but I put bricks under the <laughs> <laughs> under the under the back of the the treadmill, so it elevates it, and I use a level so I know what the what the ele- you know what the percentage is, and then yeah, I just ran at um, around 450 pace, and I think it was at negative two percent. You know what kind of what Boston is. Yeah, and then yeah. three miles that night, and then your last day. 10 miles easy in the morning, lunch, you went out, you did eight 1200s at 440 pace. And then the evening you ran four miles for a total of 178 miles. Wow. So <laughs> you're going to win, right? Like, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was one Cam Levin's week, I think. <laughs> Erica, listening to that and knowing you as well as I do, you know, how does that make you feel? You know, the thing with the marathon is there's, I feel like there's a good amount of people. I mean, a lot of the women don't usually run as much as CJ, but (laughs) there's a lot of people that run a lot of miles and that's, it's not me. My favorite part about running is not running forever. Um, Long runs are my least favorite part of training, which was probably the biggest thing I had to get over with running a marathon. So I didn't even come close to that magical 100 number. So I hear that and it's like, terrifying but also like I have a lot of confidence in myself that I can run a great marathon on like not a lot of miles (laughs) what's not a lot not a lot is less than 90 nice so CJ you've run this course a couple times now coming into this race some guys with faster PRs than you Scott Fobble Connor Mance are getting a lot of the early on attention but I feel like that experience you've got even just having learned a lot from the 210 race. How are you feeling kind of like sizing up the American field? Actually, I really haven't thought about that too much. <laughs> I'm just kind of thinking about how the race in general is going to play out uh, and where I'm going to be at. Um, yeah, if, if it goes out really fast, I'm hoping that, that Connor and Scott can be uh, good guys to key off of. Um, looking at Connor's training, I think if it goes out real fast, he may be at a pace that maybe is a not where I want to be either, um, but Scott may um, be a good guy to key off of because he runs really well and, and always moves up really well. Um, but I think he's going to go out um, not super – he's going to, you know, go out at a pretty solid pace, I think. So um, just kind of knowing what they do is, is helping me in my race plan. But, yeah, I haven't thought too much about it. I'm more just – right now I'm just hoping for a good headwind so that I can, I can stay with the front pack. <laughs> So how do you go about kind of approaching racing Elliot Kipchoge? Like, that's that's the part where it's like everyone's got to try and figure out how to beat this guy. It's got to be like he's got to have his worst day and you've got to have your, your greatest day. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in practice and my long runs. Yeah, tell us what's going through your head. You've envisioned it. Yeah, so I have no idea how I'm going to get through the first 26 miles, but if I'm there the last 400, I'm out kicking <laughs> <laughs> I've out kicked him. better watch I've out. I've kicked him so many times, and I gave him a little. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've done that at, at least, you know, 200 times. Um, yeah, you know, we just got to get through the first 26, but, you know, what is that? <laughs> so, Eric, on the women's side of things, American women's distance running has had quite a revolution, especially since Des won this marathon in 2018, as we all know, in this house. We're all wearing Des's shoes. How... So seeing that success of the American women make you feel coming into this, a lot of people stepping up from the track, making marathon debuts earlier. What's going through your head when you're seeing those familiar faces of, you know, Sarah Hall, Emma Bates, Alphine, like these are women who have done this a bunch of times. Yeah, it used to be super intimidating, but now, like you said, there's so many people and it's still a little bit scary, but it's almost like it makes these world stages a little more like feasible. Because you used to watch like the world majors and you see maybe one, maybe two Americans, but especially here this year, we have like, I I think it's more than 10, but it's like an incredibly deep American field and they're all talented enough to compete with the international field. So I think it just feels a little more doable. It feels like we can do it. It doesn't even matter who at this point, but like there will be a U.S. women like waving that flag. I feel like something that you said in the Sidious 
video that we did a profile on you, you know, measuring the barometer of success in this race. And you're not like, I have to run this time and that's a good day. This is a bad day. How will you know if you had a good day? I will know if I had a good day if... Number one, I want to do another marathon. <laughs> um, we talk, My coach and I talked about that this morning. That's like super important to like get through this race and like enjoy it. And that's a lot of the um, like advice I've gotten from people like fellow pros who have run this before. They're like, enjoy the last bit, which is way easier said than done. But apparently if you enjoy the last mile of Boston, you like never want to stop running marathons. Um, other than that, I think I really want to be competitive, but I've never touched a marathon before. So I think, like I said in the Sidious interview, getting through the first half and not being toast. If I get to that halfway point and I can race the second half, I will be on cloud nine. CJ, what about you? I guess, what, how would you define success on Monday? Um, I mean, somewhat, somewhat similarly, uh, I think... Yeah, for a lot of the training block and even a lot of last training blocks, um, enjoying a lot of running um, hasn't been as easy. Um, and I think, but like coming here is just like so fun and uh, so exciting. And so I do like really want to be able to just enjoy the race, enjoy the atmosphere. Um, I think there's going to, I mean, there's going to be, there's already a ton of energy, but there's going to be so much energy on the course. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm fit enough to race well. And so I just want to be able to, to compete. Um, and not have any cramps, and, you know, <laughs> not have any stomach issues, not all those things that go bad in a marathon that keep you from purely running as hard as you can. Um, you know, if, if I can not have those, then it's going to be a good day. So final thing before we let you go. So CJ, I guess for, for Erica, who's first time marathoner, first time running this course, What's your favorite part or like what, what should she take a moment to really enjoy? Hmm. I, I like, I really enjoy the pre-marathon. So this is yeah, the best this, part. But also like this, the bus ride over there, being in the church with just everyone else. Cause I feel like it's, it's a weird energy in there because people, and I just love, it's just fun to me because I don't, it's a marathon. I, I, you don't really got to warm up. You don't really do anything. So people, people are all doing their stuff and like, it's just fun to watch everyone and be like, wow, these are like the best athletes in the world. Like I'm about to race. And it's just that, that kind of hour and a half before I really like. And then, um, around the half marathon, whatever that town is that you run through is I just remember last year, it was so loud. And so I feel like if you get to halfway, maybe don't start racing right at halfway because it's gonna, you're going to be, like, amped up because the crowd is, like, crazy there. Um, cause, so you're automatically going to be running well through that, through that stage, I think. And then, yeah, the last five miles is just fun because it's downhill and everyone screams. <laughs> I love that. Well, let's give it up for these Brooks elites who will be crushing it on Marathon Monday. Good luck, guys. We'll catch you after. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Next up, we have another Brooks professional athlete who will be racing on Monday. We're joined by New Jersey's yeah, Brian so That's Rally. why I'm sitting over here. 303 Marathon Best. But we're, we're going sub three this weekend, right? Or this Monday, right? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give it up for Brian. Thanks for joining us. Brian Reynolds, everybody. So, Brian, I guess, like, how's preparation been going for this one? Uh, if you call five-week training block good preparation, then it's going well. <laughs> yeah. Why only five weeks? What, injury? Um, something a little on? injury at the beginning of the year, and then I spent most of February in South America climbing in the Andes. So... Good Very excuse. little running. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Great cardio base, though, sleeping at 14,000 feet for three weeks. Yeah. Good altitude training in there. Yeah. So kind of like to land a little bit of context for the folks who may not be as familiar, how did you really get started on this running journey that's gotten you to this point where you're a professional marathoner, but also like you do more than that. You, it's it's the ultra stuff now. It's it's the climbs. Like, so like, how did we get to this point? By accident? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Despite not being able to walk a mile after college, I had it on my bucket list that I had to run a marathon. Why I thought that was a good idea, I'm, I'm not really sure. Still not. 
Um, but in, at the end of 2013, I got my first pair of running legs, and the first thing I did three weeks later was run a marathon. Wow. Yeah, okay, so this story always blows my mind. So first off, I mean, a pair of running legs is incredibly expensive. Yeah, tens of thousands of dollars. So the decision to get that, like, look, I think getting a pair of running shoes is a little bit of an investment, let alone committing tens of thousands of dollars. But then you only ran a few miles and then, right, like, and then decided I'll sign up for a marathon and go out and do it. How was that first one? And why didn't you <laughs> – how did that progression happen? Um, well, it went really well, I guess, until the infamous mile 20. Um, and also the fact that I only run five miles at max before. Um, and after that, I was like, great, I ran a marathon. I never, ever have to do this again. And put my running legs away and didn't think about them for a few years. And it wasn't really until the middle of 2016 that I ended up taking the running legs back out and deciding to give it a go with running. And it's been full speed ever since. So there's a story, though, of, like, didn't you just race a mile randomly one day? Yeah, I, I raced a mile and ran 442 or 44 or something. It's on a it. whim. Yeah. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm, like, maybe, maybe I'm fast. <laughs> I should try. <laughs> So as you come in out of a five-week training block, what are the expectations for this race? I hope I can make it to the finish. <laughs> um, no, I, I think for five weeks I maximized it as much as I could. I had a bunch of runs in the 18 to 20-mile range, and they, they all went well. So hoping I can come closer to three hours. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer the uphills or the downhills of Boston? Hmm. Um, the downhills are harder for me um, without having the heel to, to stop. So I end up getting carried down downhills faster than I should go, which then makes the uphills harder. <laughs> In general, I prefer uphills. How's, that, how's the preparation for, you know, when even the pros are talking about the beating that your legs take when you're running downhills. And for you, I guess, like, that's a total different adjustment in training. Yeah, honestly, I avoid it in training just because it beats me up more. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't do as much downhill running as I should preparing for Boston. Um, this so your treadmill's not a, yeah. Yeah. On a, on a couple of bricks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I had running up and down Aconcagua yeah. for three weeks, so I was going down like 50% declines on that. Um, and obviously up it multiple times. So maybe I'm more prepared for downhills this year than I normally would be. How many marathons have you done at this point? I don't know. <laughs> um, during COVID, I did a bunch of a bunch of the uh, like virtual neighborhood marathons. So I don't know if we count those. Um, but official marathons, this might be eight. Is there anywhere that you get a greater reception from fans than in Boston? No. Definitely What's that not. like? Um, last year was my first time running Boston, and it blew away every expectation I could have. Um, the crowds were just absolutely amazing, and growing up in Boston, I had so much family and friends out on the course. Um, it was just an experience unlike any other. For you, I guess, like, what is sort of, like, the overarching message or just, like, that you want spectators or someone watching you do this take away? Uh, the lesson I've learned in life is to never limit yourself. I spent the first 25 years of my life hiding, wearing pants, and just mentally limiting myself. Like, this is something that I shouldn't do, can't do. And I started running with one minute a day for a week and then two minutes a day for a week, and it eventually turned into a mile and two miles and marathons. And I wish I had started that earlier. I wish I hadn't limited myself for so long. Yeah. Well, Brian, I, I, we are now, what, less than 48 hours out. What do you do between now and then? Um, lots of relaxing, soaking in the energy around Boston, wandering around the expo. Yeah. Haven't done that yet. So, um, yeah, just enjoying all the energy that Boston gives, which is absolutely incredible. It's unlike any other world major that I've been to. So that last, you know, left on Hereford, right on Boylston. Mm -hmm. Thinking back on that last year, what, what are you going to be thinking about in that moment? What do you want to soak in this year? Uh, this year, it's to not trip and fall. <laughs> uh, I did that coming through the, uh, was it Kenmore Square or something there? 
Uh, wherever there's like some cobblestones, I manage to trip and fall, which seems to be my MO in marathons. I fall a lot in marathons. Um, hopefully I don't do that this year. Yeah. Well, Brian, we appreciate you taking the time for this. Wishing you all the best of luck. Let's give it up for Brian Rails, everybody. Good luck. All right. So now let's uh, let's get geeky a little bit. We're going to break down the men's and women's elite races, and we're going to save our predictions for the very end. So we'll start with the men's race first, since they go off first. Obviously, a lot of attention on this one coming into it is on Elliot Kipchoge, the world record holder, two-time Olympic champion. He's running Boston for the very first time on his quest to try and win all six world marathon majors. He's won all of them but New York and Boston. So my presumption is the plan is hopefully try and win here and then try and win in New York and then Paris Olympics. And then that's a pretty nice way to end a career. But... If he doesn't win, then, like, I guess he's got to come back and <laughs> extend his whole entire career. But so it really is starting to feel like Kipchoge versus the field. Kyle, I guess, who else are you watching in this one? Well, I mean, first off, a little more on Kipchoge. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't heard now. So he's won 15 out of 17 marathons. Yep. And that's not counting the two sub two attempts, which I'm going to go, with, I'm going to say is he's one and one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, the thing about it is he's so consistent, and that's what makes him really great at this point. Um, you know, the last time he lost was in London in 2020. And that was just a weird race because it was raining, and I think he had, like, his ear clogged, and it was like... I don't really understand the ear clog <laughs> thing, but, I'm, like, if he says it affected him yeah. and I haven't had a clogged ear, then I'm, like, okay. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, and then the other one that he lost was 2013 to, in Berlin to Wilson Kipsang, who... Ran the world record. Who's currently serving a four-year ban? <laughs> so, like, I don't know, maybe sixteen out of seventeen. <laughs> the thing that we've been talking about all weekend, Kyle specifically, is how different coming to a weekend like the Boston Marathon is for a Kipchoge. He is monk-like in his lifestyle, eating the same thing, cooking his own meals, running the same way. He's had a regimented routine for I have no idea how old he is for how many years he's been doing this, he's but yeah. For him to come into this environment yeah. must be, it's he's good at it by now because he's completely recognized around the world, but I can't imagine all the appearances. It's yesterday. funny the way that we do that, right? It's like, all right, you live in a training camp for three months and live like a monk. And then it's like biggest race <laughs> of the season. Come out. You have three appearances a day. You're not going to cook any of your own meals. You're running around like you're shaking hands. Like, how is everyone not on the line sick immediately? But, I mean, that's why they pay you the appearance fee. Yeah. So, Kipchoge, uh, the odds did come out for this one. There was some odds put out by Bovada, minus 400 for him. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, the, he's you've got to put money on him to try and win this race. But there is some good value in some of the other guys. If we looked at the fields that we flash on on the screen before, I think there's yeah. a handful of guys who have run under 205, including two guys. It's Amos Capruto and Evans Chabet, who the two of them combined won half of the World Marathon majors last year. It was London, Boston, and Chicago. During the press conference yesterday, they were talking about experimenting with a couple team tactics, but then... Then again, that could be just to cast that out there and try and mess and get into Kipchoge's head. Like, there's just so much to, to consider there. That's the real question is, I don't think it's whether Kipchoge takes the W. It's what the strategy of the race is. Yeah. Does he take it out? When does he go? Because a lot of, you know, he's been avoiding, I'm going to say it, avoiding Boston and New York. These are challenging world majors. They have more hills and difficulty in turn than some turns than some of the other he's ones. He's never said that. That's just <laughs> yeah. for the record. That's what I'm <laughs> saying. His, yeah. reason for not having He's done saving the best for last. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, I think like if you're breaking down the narrative of how fans should watch this race, it's Kipchoge versus Kipruto and Chibet versus the field. Yeah. Because those two guys, they're going to do something. Kipchoge has traditionally tried to make his big move around 17 miles and then just a smaller one. And the big one tends to happen around 20-ish. And then from there, it's just a solo show for the final 10K. But there's so many guys in this race who have the wheels to go with him. Uh, so I don't know. Like, it's just the thing. It's like you can't even throw out the thing of like, oh, he's there's no pacemaker. So 
He's, he's done it before. He's you done know? it before at the Olympics. So uh, there's just no p possible scenario that is kind of drawn up there like, oh, this is the plan that's going to work because he's won in every single one in the past. So it's going to be hard. Well, we were talking about this, obviously, just with Eric and CJ is like knowing the course important. They're all 26 miles. It's straight. You know, if you run a marathon on 17 occasions, then, you know, you know the marathon pretty well. And ultimately... Kipchoge doesn't know the course. He's even said he hasn't gone out and run the course. He's driven it. Evans Chibet won it. Benson Cabruto has won it. And both of these guys, you know, saying to the the way that Kipchoge wins the race, they both won the race with huge pushes at 35K previously. Yeah. So it, I don't see this race necessarily going out super fast. I think everyone's going to kind of be keying off Kipchoge being like, well, what does he want to do? What does he want to do? I mean, CJ might be the one wild card who might turn this into a 202 race. Yeah. But um, ultimately, I do. I, I think that this is a possible scenario in which we see a negative split. Is that insane? Uh, on this course? That's when I, like, but if yeah. they don't go, they don't no. go. Yeah. So I mean, you, get, you get a lot of that downhill at the end too. So, and yeah. Kipchoge said he hasn't really changed his training. Would you? At all. For this. Absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely not. He's doing the same thing. He has a pattern that works. So, and you know, Monday's looking to be pretty great conditions. Perhaps the wind in Boston always plays a factor, but it's, I'm not going to jinx anything. Yeah. It's, I, I don't know. I just can't foresee a scenario where he, where he, doesn't have a trick up his sleeve to try and break those guys. Those guys are the ones who are right now scheming, and they've got 48 hours to draw up a plan, and I don't know what it's going to be. Be fitter than Kipchoge. Good luck. Yeah. So, all right, if, do we have a wild card? Like, who else are we maybe watching besides those three? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, those are... Gabriel Gay from Tanzania has run 203. Her Pasta Nagas has run 203.40. But again, like, these are people who have fast PRs on paper. What I does think. it mean? What, and that's like the thing. Like, what is a 203 in Valencia worth on an Boston. actual race? Right. You know, it's no pacers. It's not, I mean, Valencia has been designed to be the fastest course possible in the world. And now you're taking it here. And, you know, what is that? What's the situation all of a sudden? I mean, Gay. Ran 203 flat, but yeah. has never won a marathon. No, I think the one I look at potentially is Albert Career, which is like he won the 2021 New York City Marathon. Rough 2022. Rough 2022, but l maybe learned from a sixth place finish in Boston here last year. It's just, I don't know. I, uh, so it's so hard to break through from those those top three, uh, three guys that maybe Albert Career is my dark horse. You also look to the guys who have placed, you know, that second, third yeah. here in Boston before that really know the course well. And it's great that we have such a deep field here this year that it's incredible to have, you know, a lot of those guys coming back. Uh, another guy that, you know, we should be maybe considering is Chur Katata. Yeah. Who is the guy who beat Kipchoge in 2020. And is consistent. Is yeah. always up there. That's he, a mental advantage for sure. He was closing really hard at the New York City Marathon last year. He just kind of ran out of real estate and finished second. But he's another one of those guys that, like I said, like, him and Chibet last year was entertaining. And so, yeah, add him into the mix as well. But, I mean, we have the, the names on screen. You have to go down the list a little bit to find the top Americans. So, I, I guess, easy transition here. Let's talk about the top <laughs> Americans. Perfectly executed transition. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Connor Mance, fastest America, uh, American in the field with the 208.16 PR from last year's uh, Chicago Marathon, his debut. Scott Fobble, 208.52, is, is the second fastest guy and has been the top American here twice. Then you've got a slew of other guys who in recent years have broken 210, and that was kind of like a you know discussion here back in 2019. It's like American men are not breaking 210 anymore, and now we're, we're starting to break through there. It's sort of like... At this point, can Mance and Fobble be the guys who lead us into that 206, 207 range? And who are the other guys who are going to come along for the ride? I do want to first like say the reason why we don't have more American men under 210 is because everyone runs Boston and New York every year. Like, yeah. Those are the two. Would you rather go to Boston, New York? It's familiar. You get a greater appearance fee, more lights on you. Or would you rather go to Valencia where they're not going to pay you? You'll get a, you know, you might run 206, 207. But that's part of the reason why the times of the Americans are not quite there compared to some of our foreign friends. Yeah. 
And but, this morning, you even had the hot take, I guess, while we were uh, walking. Okay, I had over. a lot of hot takes, so I'm excited to see. <laughs> well, you were just like, I don't think the fastest American marathon is going oh, yeah. to come out of Boston this weekend. There's some guys running out in Rotterdam. Rotterdam is tomorrow. You have Andrew Colley, Shadrick Kipchir, Cheer, Footsum Zanislasi, and like, that's a fast course. Like, one of those guys might run 207. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think the big takeaway from this weekend's race is just sort of like, uh, these American guys are just looking to compete, try and finish as high as possible, and just uh, get that big rep in against some of the top in the world and some of the top Americans because you don't really run for time here and you don't want to, you don't necessarily need a fast, shiny PR heading into the Olympic trials. At this point, a lot of people are just working backwards in their mental calendar, looking at February of next year where the Olympic trials will be held in Orlando and just working their way backwards. And so, how does Boston fit into that? It's just a really good chance to compete. I don't want to move off the Americans without talking about Ben True. I think it's That's someone right. that we okay, have. Okay, Dartmouth. Okay, along. okay. <laughs> I think that, you know, Ben True showed up really well in his recent half marathon. It's yeah. someone who is hungry, looking for redemption. It's something we were talking to CJ earlier. You know, when it's been a while since you've tasted that victory you're looking for, I think Ben True really has a lot to fight for or trying to become that top American. But However, Connor Mance has just continually impressed me with his the mustache with his mustache um, continually impressed you the last six weeks you know I'm on, I'm on his wife's team with that one yeah, but you know get rid of it okay you know that's that's his personal decision <laughs> if it makes you feel like you're gonna run faster I don't know how arrow it is yeah but I think his speed will make him a factor which is really exciting to see how many Americans we can get into that top 10 that is when you're getting to this level of racing guys who've run, you know, much of the field, 203, 204, it is important to have that track speed, which Connor does have. I mean, this is a guy who is fourth at the Olympic trials in the 5K, and he's still actively on the track. Yeah, he said he's going back after this, too. Yeah, and so when thinking of long-term potential, I root for Connor because I see him as a guy long-term who I know has that ability to drop the sub-14 5K that is mm -hmm. needed to win races and that's something game. like a Shalane Flanagan before she won New York said that her 5K speed helped her. I think she ran in the 15, sub 15.40 for that last 5K. It really helps have that strength and confidence, especially when there could be a lot of people there and a lot of carnage to pick up. And then there's Scott Fobble. Yeah. Who is Mr. Mr. Consistent. Consistent. Well, uh, <laughs> Jinx, you owe me an autobot. <laughs> um, Scott. Stop. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming out today. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I've been saving that one for so long. <laughs> um, but Scott, I mean, he's he runs Boston and he runs New York, and he's a guy. Again, to the point. I mean, we Mac. I think most of all is probably constantly nagging Scott to go race in Europe a little bit more in one of these flat, fast courses. But I mean always the top American, always in the top 10 in these fields. And this is might be the most competitive field yet. So if he can replicate that, I think setting himself up really well for Orlando, because, you know, we love the boss marathon, but if you haven't made an Olympic team, that's probably the number one goal left. He learned so much and just kind of like in just sort of the way he carries himself after the disappointment of missing the Olympic team in 2020. And like, I think that was just a big pivotal moment for him to just kind of he got he leaned into all of the attention leading up to it, felt the pressure, and then ever since then he's got I, his mantra coming into this race is something about like just believing in in the present. And Joe, he he said he had a really fancy quote. He just ripped it from uh, Headspace, yeah. is what he <laughs> confessed to me later on. And then uh, he's just in a really good spot, trusting his training, trusting you know his experience and his record on the course. That it is also really hard to bet against Scott. And so um, really funny story was I think someone asked him. Uh, who would win in a bar fight between him and Connor Mance? And he says, well, I don't think Connor's ever been into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 0-1. Yeah. So it's, it, was, it was funny. This um, is a great race. I think Boston, before thinking about Orlando 2024, the timing works out so well. So we're here in April. You take some time off. You do a summer racing series. And then you just have a lot of runway for your build. Yeah. Um, All right. So we're going to save our predictions. Save it. Should we move to the women's race? All right, and this one, it's the opposite of the Elliot Kipchoge show because I would say there's no favorite in this one. There's no main act. There, no. I mean, a little bit there's of someone I don't even know who you're going to say. That's oh, how. I don't think there's a favorite, but there's, you know, a time that's oh, yeah. minutes 
ahead personal best wise. If we're gonna fair, if, <laughs> yeah, like if we're if we're going thematically again, Aman Barizzo of Ethiopia running two fourteen fifty eight, um, beating Gade out in what was supposed to be the big debut. I mean. Is once again, is that 214 <laughs> at Valencia worth anything in Boston? Yeah, what is we'll it? Find out. We'll find out. Um, and so she's a wild card, and that's not like she's a seasoned veteran in terms of being a marathoner, in terms of she's run many marathons, but she's had numerous injuries throughout her career. I believe took some time off, came back, and now I think. What she did Boston in 2016? Yeah, different running runner. 230 back, something, right? like totally different runner now. And so she's a wild card. I yeah. mean, she's the, the top seed, but still a wild card. We're not that familiar with her yet as an athlete. Yeah, it's, it feels so unfair to be like, look at someone who's like run 214 and be like, is it a fluke? But I mean, we're really going to find out like what that's worth on a, on a course like this. You can't like accidentally run 214. <laughs> yeah. But it's just more of a matter of like, does that translate into a harder course without rabbits? She could have stopped and still beat the next person. It's like, yeah. <laughs> on that. It's been that done race. before. I think it's incredible it's to wild. see like the amount of women sub two twenty. You know, we're in this new area era of new shoe technology and the strides that have been made to be this like, yeah, it might be a sub. 220 race at Boston. Yeah. Like that's the new standard. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I just counted. You can see it right there. And when we have the, the fields up, nine women with PRs under 220. And it, it's like the shoes and the, you know, kind of the arms race that we've seen over the last couple of years into the advances in technology have just really kind of changed my perception of like when I remember when I would see a time that was like 218, I'd be mind blown. And sort of like now that gets you one, two, three, four, five sixth on the list it's crazy i will say i i kind of like where we're at now in 2023 in terms of this arms race because i do feel that every brand has their nuclear weapon mm -hmm. is that a bad analogy um it, but like perhaps. everyone has caught up <laughs> <laughs> everyone at this point has an excellent shoe whereas like a few years ago you know a couple brands had a shoe and everyone else was like well what are we supposed to do and now it's like across the board I've tried them all. They're all great. And now it's just like, what do you personally like or who's your sponsor? And there's been enough time exactly for like, the sponsor side of things that if you didn't like what you were running in, you could switch and flip. And now everyone's running in their quiver of choice. We'll, we're going to see what happens. Brooks, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, but it's, so now that depth is only, you know, after a few years of that being the case, now everyone has it. Everyone's running really fast. There are 20 women, sub 223, and the first one out, Emma Bates. So, you know what? Who said she feels like she's <laughs> in, she feels like she's in 218 shape. So, yeah. you know, just put her in there already. Yeah. So, well, so on the pro side of things, uh, on the elite women's side of things, we have, we talked about Amane Bariso, and like we look at some of the other names on that top end of things. Lona Sal Peters, another person who was bronze medalist at the World Championships, finished second in New York. Tokyo um, champ. Yeah, past Tokyo champ. Gotti Num, Gebrislase is uh, world champion and has been on the podium multiple times. Edna Kiplagat just got her second uh, yeah. Boston Marathon title. I really enjoyed how they did that. They did a secondary, you know, Gave her the wreath, gave, they the gave medal. her the medal as they should. Taking, thought, getting that moment taken away from her. Yeah, I thought it should have been on Monday. Like, yeah, do it on Monday. Race, instead of just like Wednesday beforehand, before anyone was Yeah, but I guess if you the raced sidewalk. and then you didn't have the day that you wanted, <laughs> yeah. it'd be a little awkward. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I just wish there were more people there to celebrate it. One uh, thing to know is Gabriel Selassie has run four marathons and has never fish, finished lower than third. Okay. All right. So bet on her to yeah, make the podium. I, I always look at the consistency. It's like, what's the the worst you've ever done? Do you DNF regularly? Like, I don't, I don't want to bet on you if you're a regular you know, DNF, but a lot of these women are super consistent and that's what makes this field so difficult to challenge. But as we're talking about Gabriel Selassie, looking at her season, another thing I like to look at besides just you know how consistent you are what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. And she was second at the rack half. But you know who beat her? Helen O'Beary, who is like further down on the on the list. Like she's really, like, she's, Helen yeah. O'Beary. Helen know, O'Beary's in the second column, and that just doesn't feel right. Helen O'Beary's got a personal best of two twenty five when she finished sixth at last year's New York City Marathon. Like it was a very underwhelming de debut. She was clearly disappointed by it, but like 
check her no don't she's not on strava but check joe Klecker's. <laughs> has anyone had like a first <laughs> marathon debut that is completely i mean i'm sure people have not come knocked it completely out of the park but i side all. <laughs> okay all right all right i stand corrected <laughs> all right i'm not the stats guy of the crew however i think with with helen just getting yeah. that experience of the distance and new york this fall was hard yeah, hard yeah. challenging conditions it was hot and humid and now she has had a few months under her belt. I'm ex really excited to see how she does. The other, the other part about Helen that is interesting, kind of inside baseball type of thing, is that like for her training for New York, one of the big adjustments for her was fueling on the course, which is like you struggled with that too, like making the transition I, to the marathon. Yeah, yeah. But, I threw up in the Uber home <laughs> all over yourself. <laughs> uh, but it's it's like one of those things that maybe for like us common people, it's like as easy as just telling someone like, oh yeah, take a gel every forty minutes. But for these elite athletes, like it's just snatching well, the water bottles. Well, if you miss a the bottle, amount. they drop, you fall. It's crazy, and so like for her, like she was skipping stations just because like. She felt like it, and it's like comes back to hide her, like to to hurt her. And she, I asked her, so like, how's the fueling training going? And she was like, well, I think I'm ninety percent at it now. So, I'll, I think we'll see a bit of that improvement. And I think the other part of that is for Helen is holding back. She's always the person to like just push it from the front, and yeah. that's just the way she loves to race. Dathan's we love always to watch it. Love to watch it. I think her form absolutely stunning. Yeah, I mean, she goes to the arms. Looks like a sprinter in the final like four hundred meters of of the race. The first four hundred and meters. the first four. She looks the same, but well, she kind of looks like she's laboring at the beginning, and then her form gets even better as the race goes on. Yeah. It's really interesting, and so she's she's fit. She's ready to go. The Stay question for, for me on this race is time. Yeah, like is this going to be? A fast race on the woman's side. I personally think it's gonna be a little bit more conservative given the depth. I think it's gonna be a lot of chicken going on and with this type of pack, especially with the amount of people, unless, you know, our two fourteen just decides yeah, yes. Bercio decides to go, hey, full send. I'm I don't wanna deal any, with anyone. We got we've got one Japanese athlete. They're never scared to go out. We've seen that here before. Haruka yeah. Yamaguchi. Um another athlete who I'm definitely watching is Ababel Yashina. Okay. It was second last year. She lost by four seconds. That was she, a crazy finish. She almost won. Yeah. All right. So she knows the course, and it, and it worked. I All mean, right. she, it's, she, she DNF'd at Worlds and had two other DNFs since. So we don't know what we're getting. Okay. But if you've come within four seconds of winning this race, of winning Boss Marathon, someday your day will come. You know, as Lyndon did that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, um, let's talk about the Americans in this field real quick. Let's Another talk. one where I think. There is a little bit of a separation of like two heavy hitters, which and it's two. Yeah, maybe actually three or four now that I'm looking <laughs> at, the, at the list. Um, but I was really kind of I'm intrigued by how well Alfin Tuliamuk, the reigning U.S. Olympic trials champion, and Emma Bates are going to run because the both of them I think were talking la uh, yesterday during the press conference very, very confident in their fitness and also. Like they're putting themselves sort of in that mindset where they can see themselves being in that 218, 219 range. And like you've talked to Ben Rosario, he's had great things to say about Alfin's training. Yeah, Emma Bates just straight up said, like, She's, I feel like a 218, 2, 219. Yeah, and runner. Emma's placed in the top three at World Major. She plays top three in Chicago. Yeah. She also, I think this is very, I don't want to say low risk, high reward, but these women have run a lot of races. They want have run at the world championship and Olympic level. For them, this is about testing how they can compete as a tune-up with the expectation that you will be running in Paris 2024. Both so, of them were like saying that they can see themselves winning this race, which I, is I, nuts. It was kind of refreshing. I feel like you have athletes who come and have the press conferences and they're just, you know, kind of keep everything close and Running's a very humbling sport. We've all had our asses kicked at one point. And just me many times. To have, <laughs> have yeah. some of us have had never not never <laughs> not had our ass kicked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's just refreshing to hear athletes come out and just bring that confidence and just that buzz. And I don't know, it's like electric to hear that interview. And that makes me more excited to cheer for them because like now I'm invested. Yeah. So, and then on the, uh, Sarah Hall is another person. That's what like, I say. We can't forget about Sarah Hall. Just won the 10 mile. Yeah. The only thing that concerns me is like, that she hasn't had like blossom. the perfect buildup and 
But then again, you'd never need. Stay hungry. Yeah. You don't need to have it to be perfect. Unless she's bluffing. Like, that's the other thing, too, is, like, I think one of my favorite parts of the press conference is you're never going to talk to an athlete who says, like, they're feeling bad. Like, and so someone in this room is clearly lying. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All interviews should be done with lie detector tests. Oh, 100%. You said your training went great. (laughs) And Uh, then I think, like, the other last, you can't sleep on Dez. Like, that's the other part to it, too. I'm most impressed with just how jam-packed her schedule is <laughs> incredible leading. and she's like it never gets normal to have to do it since 2018 like you win you come back and it's just like a lot of stuff a lot of sponsorship obligations the press conference and you're just you're on your feet a lot i guess when when you're that good like that's just what happens top this year. new york times best-selling author in the field for sure easily yeah yeah in uh, 2018 early early days of sidious we were you know Chris Chavez, David Melly and I were in the basement of my apartment in the South End. It was garden level. It was a basement. And I said, absolutely, Des is not winning. And she proved me wrong. So I'm never making that prediction ever, ever again. So whoever... Say CJ's not going to (laughs) win. CJ is going to... He's not going to win. Wink. And then the top American in the field the last two years. Nell Rojas. I mean, we're sleeping. We're yeah. sleeping for sure. And Nell really prioritizes strength training more so than it, I mean, more publicly than other athletes. But I think that really helps you with the pounding of the downhills here. Yeah. All right. So should we move into predictions? Oh, like gosh. Yeah. I'm so but nervous. Now that we talked about it, I kind of want to change a few of my things. <laughs> well, so the other part to this too is like we're recording this on Saturday yeah. and I don't know. Like Reserve so, the right to change had, our minds. You, you had this very dark joke on the run this Uh-oh. morning where you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just all the athletes are going, no, no. <laughs> you're not going to tell the joke about the car. But just the idea of like, you see all the athletes running along the Charles and the Charles, like you cross roads, there's lots of bridges. And I'm just like, I hope no one's like, <laughs> ever, like, I hope everyone stays safe out there. <laughs> Boston is it's not known for its city. drivers. Driving yeah. around in Boston's the scariest thing I've ever done, and I'm a regular New York driver. Yeah. It's a different brain. So, <laughs> assuming that everyone arrives to the starting line safe, <laughs> and th- that there are no like major field changes in the next couple days, we're sticking with these predictions. All right, so okay. I'll lead it off. We're going to give our champion and our top American. We'll start with... Uh, the men's side. I'm I'm going to be very boring, I think, in my picks. I'm going Elliot Kipchoge for my men's champion. It's just hard to bet against the greatest of all time. And then for my top American man, I'm going to go with the guy who's in a group chat that we have. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the City of Smack group chat. I'm going Scott Which Fobble. he hangs out in far too close to race day. We're like, please yeah. mute us. I almost like had to text the rest of us. I mean, guys, like, I think we have to shut it down around like 2 o'clock today before, yeah. you know. I was t- like, guys, so Connor Manzi looked amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so don't ruin it. All right, let's move to Kyle's picks. Kyle, who you got for your champion? Yeah, okay. So I have Evans Chabet, who... <laughs> no, wait. That's, no, that's, that's, that's not my good. pick. <laughs> <laughs> We have a screen up here. Yeah, there we go. Instrument. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, he won New York. He won Boston. Here's a very fun fact. <laughs> what ranking do you think that got him in the world? Uh, he won this New is a York whole nother conversation. So one. No. Wrong. 13th in the world. <laughs> really? Kyle, this could be a complete other podcast <laughs> okay. about the world rankings. Vincent Cabruto. He won London. No, no, no. Uh, Chicago. He's number one in the world. 12. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. So I picked Evans just because, you know, I haven't seen him lose a major recently, but I heard he got married and (laughs) then got a little injury. Okay. And now I'm like, oh, it's the best. It's not reflective of your career, Kyle. So I'm, yeah. I was going to say, I got a lot slower once I got married. Um, I think it was the surgery that I had that was not related, but. Uh, I'm sorry, Patricia. Um, <laughs> no, but I think if I could do two guys on that screen, it'd be Chibet or Kipruto. We can't do that. I know, okay. I know we can't, but I think one of the training partners wins. And then my top American, I believe I went with Connor Mance. With a mustache. With no. a mustache. <laughs> this is before I knew he had a mustache. Okay. Um, I don't, 208 debut. And we've seen him run really well on NCAAs on a hilly course. Uh, we saw him run a good 10K just recently sound and... I don't know. I feel good about Connor. I think he can handle a fast pace. 
All right, so let's move to Dana's picks. All right, let's not jinx them, but I do have the GOAT, Kipchoge, taking it. I would love to see a course record. If you're going to make your mark, do it at Boston. That would be... That'd be a good day for me. Yeah, it still stands. Personally. 203 from 2011, like the windy day. Joffrey Mutai was the guy in pre-Super Shoes era. Like that, 203. That time is so crazy. far off. 159. Yeah. 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 All right. So who's your top American? My top American is Connor Mance, no mustache. Okay. <laughs> so I don't even know if it's the same guy. <laughs> I've, I saw him this morning on our, you know, Brooks shakeout run. He wasn't participating in the run, but I think he's calm, cool, collected, and I think he's absolutely racing beyond his years. Okay. And I love that he stepped up to the marathon so early in his career because it just makes it really exciting to see what he can do. I thought my Instagram caption was received well, where it was like, what what does uh, Mustache and Connor Mance's marathon and career have in common? They're both going to get better with time. <laughs> Such a dumb joke. I was going to say short-lived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Damn. <laughs> what? <laughs> All, right. All right. That's a cue for Max Fix. Mac, we'll get we'll toss it over to My you. My god, what was that? <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, that that's a good turn." Just take the Let's opposite. Cut that one out. Like, do we have a 5 second delay to mute this? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, give me Evans to bet for our overall winner. I think he's going to sit on Kipchoge and I think he's going to annoy him. Yeah. Like, people have sat on Kipchoge previously and he, he continues to look back, look back. And then generally he does just pull away. But I think Evans to bet's uh, experience on the course. How would uh, you annoy someone during a marathon running behind them? Uh, you, you clip, clip them. You clip them. Uh, I was thinking like, you just like talk too much. No, it's just, you, don't, you, do, you don't do your, you don't do your share breather. the lead. You don't help yeah. lead. Uh, and you just, you just sit. And I think he might just clip his heels for, you know, maybe yeah. 20 miles. And then I think <laughs> his, his experience is going to take over. And DQ. then for my... What if Kipchoge wins on a DQ? <laughs> yeah. That would be that, amazing. That would be yeah. incredible. Hey, just get the USATF officials out there. Don't DQ anybody. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and then for my overall American, give me CJ. Yeah. Uh, I love CJ. I also like that he's kind of on the front end of his like sort of bell curve of his marathon build. I think a lot of people tend to race on the back end of it. And I like his sort of like freshness on the front end. And uh, what about his training made you think he is fresh? <laughs> nothing, nothing to do with the 178 miles. Uh, no, he's just, I think he's had a f a, just a few weeks less of training than what he previously would have done. And I think that that's going to like, actually bode him pretty well. Um, and I think he's going to be a little bit smarter this year and maybe not lead the first 18 miles. This is why so I if he's racing the, the other Americans, I think he's going to beat the other Americans. He's the best downhill runner in the world. There might be a headwind on Monday, so that bodes well for CJ. <laughs> yeah. All, All right, right, let's go to our women. Women's picks. All right, so uh, my champion, I'm going with... Helen O'Beary, uh, I was very impressed with the NYC half performance. And I knew then, you'd go with Helen. She's just like so, she's a killer, I think, when it comes yeah. to the competition. Like, I, you know, she's sitting in that second column of the, of the field. Underdog. Where, <laughs> underdog story. So I think people are going to get a dose of, of Helen O'Beary just absolutely just go into the arms with, from the start. <laughs> and uh, she's going to run away with it. I, world cross country champion like this is a course that is built for her so um i'm going helen o'beary for the win my top american i'm going alfine uh tulia mook mac let's let's get alfine's photo on there uh also just very impressed she was one of the coolest things that stood out to me when i talked to her yesterday was um that she was studying the races she's never run boston before she's been putting in a good training block in uh, Flagstaff, but she went back and watched the races and she was looking at not the winner and what they were doing, but just kind of like some of the faster people on uh, on paper and like where they fell apart in the race. And so Paris Jip Chirchi, who's a half marathon world record holder, uh, or was at one point, I'm, I can't remember who's got that record, but oh, it's Gaudet. Um, but yeah, this is a weird how Chris's nerd. brain works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just an insight. Well, so so like uh she fell apart on the downhills and so uh there was one in particular that alfine really studied closely um and that's where really she's expecting like a big move to be made so uh i'm just really impressed to see i asked her sort of best build-up since like the olympic trials because she was really pumped and she was like maybe the best build-up ever and so uh i'm going alfine for my top american woman 
All right, Kyle, who you got? Um, I think I'm going with Amane Brizzo. Yeah. So you're going. I think it's real. I think 214 <laughs> converts <laughs> to Boston. Um, Answering your own question. Yeah, to answer my own question, I think. Uh, as long as she stays patient, which is what she did in Valencia. And if she can do that, then I think she has that second half that we're looking for. So, I don't know. It's a wild card. It's fun. It's anyone's game right now, so you might as well go with the person who's run the fastest. And who's your top American woman? I go with Alphine as well. Uh, just that short, abbreviated buildup to New York and then to come out and finish so close to the win. You know, now with a full, healthy buildup, what does that mean? Probably good things. Yeah. And you gave good reason, so I'll piggyback on you. All right. Sweet. All right, Dana, who do you have for your champion? All right. I have a little bit of a wild card. I've got Lona Salpeter. I've always really liked her. That's not a great reason to pick her. <laughs> <Yeah>. but <laughs> That's a good enough reason. Yeah. She, her last marathon win was 2020 at the Tokyo Marathon. She placed third at Worlds this past summer, second in New York, 3-2, one, yeah. it's time for her to step up. Really consistent racer. She's 34 years old, I believe. And I think there's something special about that where she's just a really experienced racer at this distance. You guys probably also remember her from um, dropping back at the, to at the um, Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics. Olympics where Molly Seidel scooped that bronze medal. So I think- Which she, was hers for a while. Which was her bronze medal. So I think she has something that she's racing for. And I'm really excited to see how she does. 34 is that good age where they're not talking about how old you are yet. <laughs> like you're experienced and you're a veteran. You've done it a lot, but no one's like, I don't know how they're still out there. How <laughs> old are you, Kyle? Yeah. I'm 32. I still got time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Top American for you. All right. I had to go with Emma Bates. I, Emma's been at the queen of consistency in marathoning. She, you know, she does fall, spring, fall, spring, fall, spring. And... Really, you know, if you talk the talk, let's see her walk the walk. It's time for her to show up. And um, the battle between her and Alphine is something I'm really looking forward to. I actually had a hard time not picking Alphine for the top American spot. But I think Emma's confidence is at a peak. And I really love her relationship with Joe Bossar, the way that he really builds her up as an athlete. And I believe she did a workout. It was a 24-mile training run, 539 pace at altitude in Boulder. It's That's become her bread and butter. So it's time for her to say hey i'm gonna run to 18 and i'm it's time uh, for the audience or the panel top american podium or no because none of us have americans winning do we have an american on the podium uh, i don't want to say i don't want to jinx it i don't on the women's side more likely than on the men's side because on the men's side we've seen fob will be top american and he finishes back in seventh i think both times and he's run faster each time out so um it's harder i think to Eat that many guys, I think, on uh, the men's side. So I could see, I, a, I see a women's podium. For I think, sure. I, I, I think I we'll see, see a lot in the top 10. Yeah. Oh, top 10 for sure. Uh, top three mm, women, on the women's side, I would say more likely. Uh, all right, Mac, close us out with your picks. Give us some, some hot, hot takes. Some hot. I don't think this is necessarily a hot take. I th uh, my champion pick is Joyce Jepkowski. Yeah. Um, she has the fastest half of 2023 coming into the field. And I think uh, just her sort of consistency. The what I, have you done for me recently? Yeah, what have method? you done for me recently? I think it's her. And I think that, you know, I'm going to disagree with Dana a little bit. I think that she actually might be pushing around halfway. I think she might be taking the lead. And it's going to be one of those things where is the field going to catch her by the finish line? Um, if I were a betting person, if we could legally, which we're not allowed to here, um, it would be for her to be leading at like three fourths the way through. And it's going to be the, the pack trying to catch her. Um, for my top American, I am going to agree with Dana here and go with uh, Emma Bates. Her consistency of running these marathons is, is extremely impressive. And I think her new, I don't want to say newfound confidence because she's always been confident, but um, her belief in her fitness for this is what's really impressive. And I don't think she's ever been one to not back up her words. So look, I think look for her to not just be racing the Americans, but be racing other women in the, in the field that are um, what we would consider traditionally better than, than our Americans. So um, I think she's going to crush it. Sweet. So those are our picks. We'll see how it all unfolds on Monday morning. We will be back live on the Sidious Mag YouTube channel with our 
watch along party uh, starting at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And this, you know, this has been awesome. I guess I mean, do this with a live audience, crack a couple jokes, share some hot takes. And I'm just looking forward to Monday because I once asked a professor of mine in college if I could come to class late because I would miss the end of Boston Marathon. Okay. I was like, I'll just be honest. I'll How be did like, that hey, go for you? It's a two hour seminar. I'm going to be 30 minutes late, just so you know. Boston Marathon's on. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> was not okay. But um, I, I like the idea of having people to watch the race with alongside because I often watch the Boston Marathon alone at home on a Monday, you know, or school day or something. And so we'll be there. We'll sit on the couch for those of you who don't have any friends to watch the Boston Marathon with. Um, and yeah, should be fun. Thanks to everyone who came out. This was awesome. And uh, we are going to follow this right up with some some trivia with an opportunity to win some prizes. And for those people who watch this on YouTube or listened in podcast form, thanks for tuning in. And we'll catch you guys again on Monday. Play that music, Mac. <laughs> <laughs>